Good morning, baby. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. No, we got to do better than that. I'm sorry. I'm laughing too. Good morning. Good morning. All right, man, what a blessing it is to be in the house of the Lord this morning. I hope and pray that you've had a great uh, Thanksgiving holiday with your family and friends and those that you were able to get together with. Uh, just what a blessing it is to be able to do those things and to be, a, be able to participate and just love on and uh, see family, see friends. Uh, see grandbabies and uh, get to see mom and uh, all of those things that are out there. But a lot of things have happened uh, since you were here last Sunday. Uh, you'll look around this morning and see all of the Christmas decorations, and we appreciate everyone uh, who helped with that and put all of those things together. So thank you uh, for doing that as well. All right. uh, also, last Tuesday evening, we had our harvest dinner together and as always those uh, ladies do a tremendous job uh, getting there was more food here Tuesday night than uh, we've seen in a long time I guess and uh, there's a lot of appetites here Tuesday night as well uh, because when it was all said and done there's a lot of those bowls were empty and so y'all did really well not only bringing food but eating food uh, Tuesday night and so thank you for all those who prepared and made uh, everything there uh, but also, just a, a little side note for some who kind of tend to get left out. I mean, we, we recognize uh, Miss Anita and her ladies group all the, all the time. Uh, but, but there's uh, Mr. Mike and Mr. A.D. And, and Mr. Henry. There's some guys, Mr. Henry. There's those. Listen, if you drank tea or if you drank a glass of water or unsweet tea, those guys had their hands in your glass, okay? <laughs> uh, I'll just say it that way, and y'all just deal with it. It'll be all right. But they, they are the kind of the un, unsung heroes over there on the side. They sit out in their chairs, and they just do their job and do what the ladies tell them to do, uh, like all good men are supposed to do, right? Uh, especially when it comes to food. Uh, but thank you, guys, for all that you do as well. Man, what a loving church. What a wonderful church family. Uh, we are blessed to be a part of Friendship Baptist Church. I hope you grabbed a bulletin on your way in as well. You'll see other activities related to our church, our senior adult group, uh, and a trip that's coming up there next Sunday morning after our worship time together. Uh, our deacon family ministry is coming together, and we're going to feed those within our church, those who have lost a husband, lost a wife, and uh, we're going to have a special meal time prepared for you. So please come next Sunday uh, prepared to stay a little longer and let us love on you a little bit and let us provide a meal for you and just celebrate uh, just being a church and a church family together. You see a ladies gathering there. You see a children's Christmas play that's been planned, and that's going to be Sunday night, the 18th, is when they will actually perform that. And so go ahead and mark your calendars. Tell parents or grandparents or aunts and uncles and others that that Sunday night, the 18th, is the time to be here. And uh, we're going to have just a very special time with our kids that night. So many things that are happening, so many things uh, that are just taking place in the life of our church. And man, what a blessing it is. Uh, it's, it's real easy to be busy out there in the world. But it is also a blessing to have something here at church, uh, something that goes beyond the world and into our Heavenly Father. And so I want you to be involved. I, I encourage you to look at the calendar, see the things that we have, uh, be involved. I want you to be involved in our Sunday school classes. I want you to be involved on Sunday night Bible studies and all the things that we have Man, just get involved in this church and this church family. And God, I pray, will bless each and every one of us as we desire to be more and more like him. What a blessing it is. Today is a family day, and so we won't have a children's church time today, but it is a time of worship today. And so I invite you to stand with me. We're going to bow our heads together, and we're going to pray. Father, thanking you for this day and for our time together. Father, what a privilege it is to be in your presence, to worship you today. And so, Father, I pray for this, our church family. Father, as we come together, as we 
uh, have taken our time this morning, Father, to give to you our worship. And so, Father, speak to our hearts today. Move among us today. Father, may the words of the songs just speak to our hearts. All that we do, all that we say, Father, I pray this morning for your honor and your glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. While well, you're standing, we're going to take just a moment. And when I say a moment, I mean like 10 seconds. It's longer than you think. Uh, we, we still have some uh, illnesses going around the community, flu and all kinds of stuff like that. So I'm not going to ask you to shake hands, but I want you to turn around and look at that person that's probably across the room from you and just kind of, hey, it's good to see you over there. So glad y'all are here this morning. And, okay, some of y'all are kind of wishy-washy. Y'all are like waving at the ceiling and stuff. But isn't it kind of nice to see a church family that can gather and we're here for a specific reason. Number one, we start the Christmas season today. We're doing Christmas music, so I really want y'all to help us sing today. But to begin it, we're going to use a chorus from one of the Christmas songs as a praise time to the one that we're here to worship. So let's sing, For He Alone is Worthy. You'll see, I think I did have that. After our oh, yeah, choir can sing first. And then we're going to let y'all <laughs> sing. But uh, now let's go ahead and do this chorus. We're going to do For He Alone is Worthy first, since I've got you standing. Y'all know it. Sing with me. you can be seated.
Doesn't that song make you feel like it's here? Mm -hmm. Well, the season is here, and we're going to begin with one of the standards of the Christmas carols, Joy to the World. And I think you have to stand to sing it. I'm not sure. I'll get back with you. I'll do some research, but I think you have to. So if you'll join us, please. We have a responsive reading that we're going to do. The ones I read will be in white. I think, if I remember correctly, yours will be in yellow. So I will begin. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. And without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Which, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Thank you so much. You can be seated. After reading those scriptures, we really and truly see that we have something to sing about in the Christmas season. So we're going to continue with Good Christian Men Rejoice, if you'll join us as we sing.
continue with what child is this if you'll continue to help us with good singing for good singing this morning. Appreciate it very much. How many of you have put up a Christmas tree yet? How many of you have put up more than one? How many of you have put up more than two? There's, there's some of us here. And we wonder about Christmas trees sometimes, and I love reading background in history. That's just the kind of guy I am. And I have this book that I've had for probably over 30 years that is research background about Christmas. And one of the interesting little tidbits in there was where did these lighted Christmas trees come from? Well, we won't go into all of it. Uh, using trees for decoration goes way, way back. But the idea of lights on a tree, they seem to think not 100%, but they seem to think Martin Luther had something to do with it. You remember him, father of the Reformation. That's why we Baptists are here today. 
And he based it on an obscure verse from Isaiah. So before I tell you the verse, let me say, I love Christmas decorations in the sanctuary. I think it just sets everything off. And these are beautiful. Thank y'all for the hard work y'all did. But here's this verse from Isaiah chapter 60, verse 13. You're going to love this. I promise. The glory of Lebanon will come to you. The juniper, the fir, and the cypress together to adorn my sanctuary. And I will glorify the place for my feet. Isn't that awesome? I mean, even God wants his sanctuary to be beautiful. And I think it is. And I, I, this age-old tradition of mine, I like to sing this song about Christmas trees. But it has a great message about it, an even more important tree. So if you'll listen to this song called The Perfect Tree.
If you've noticed in your bulletin this morning or in the text message that you receive about our service and announcements and things uh, throughout the week, you see that the title of our message this morning is just God's plan of salvation. Very simple, very to the point. And so that's what I want to preach about this morning. God's plan of salvation. Now, I know that a lot of you this morning are going to say, well, listen, preacher, I've already heard about that. I've heard about that for 30 years or 40 or 50 years. I've been saved for lo as long as you've been alive. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand on that one. And you may have heard it all your life. And guess what? I have pretty much mine too. I've heard the gospel story my whole life. But just because we've heard it once, or just because we've heard it a thousand times, doesn't mean we don't need to hear it again. First of all, I want you to understand that we need to recall our salvation experience. It needs to be something that is so precious to us that we want to remember it, how it happened. That we want to remember that moment in time. It's, the, the moment in time is not what saves you, okay? But let me just step out and say it this way this morning. If you can't remember a time when you come to know Christ, then you didn't come to know it. So you have, there has to be some memories there. And, and I want you to relive that. I want you to remember those times or that moment in time when you gave your life to Jesus. When you asked Him to be the Lord and Savior of your life. Maybe for you it happened at a church service and the preacher preached a message. The Holy Spirit spoke to your heart and you just knew that that was your moment and you walked down an aisle. Maybe it happened for you at a revival service and somebody big name was preaching that revival and, and man, they just spoke to your heart, the Spirit did, and you walked down that aisle, you gave your life to Christ. Maybe it happened at home and you and mom or dad or it's happened with my daughter, Naomi's dad, was talking to Sarah one day. She had gone to spend uh, a few days with them and he was beginning to talk to her and she was at that time in her life at that age and it was just the right moment and, <clears throat> and, and he helped to lead her to Christ. There has to be that moment in time that God's plan of salvation for all of our lives come together. So this morning, I hope that you may recall that. But if not, I hope that today you may experience that. As I share with you, God's plan of salvation. Pray with me for just a moment. Oh, Father, you have given me a tremendous calling to share the gospel of Christ. And Father, it is my desire to do that every time I stand in front of this family in some form or fashion to, to share a gospel in a way that touches lives. But Father, this morning, it will be as direct as it can be. No beating around a bush, no, I wonder what he's trying to say. I wonder if this applies to me. But Father, today I pray, may my words be your words. And may your plan of salvation play out in every one of our lives today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God's plan so that we may relive it but also so that we may be able to share it. Man, when you've got something good 
You need to share what you have. Well, God's plan of salvation for us begins this morning, first of all, with the reasons for God's plan. There are reasons, there are reasons that are there. Why did God give us a plan of salvation? The first one, you've heard these verses many, many times, and I'm going to go through a lot of different verses throughout the Scripture, but the Bible tells us, Romans 3, 23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Why is there a need for salvation in your life? Why is there a need for salvation in my life? Why is there a need of salvation in the world? Because we are all sinners. It doesn't matter how much mama doted on you. It doesn't matter if grandma told you you were the best thing since sliced bread. It doesn't matter how good you think you are. We are all sinners. Period. And we all need salvation. God gave us a plan of salvation because, again, we are all sinners. We all fall short of the glory of God. Not only are we sinners, but folks, we are helpless sinners. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 says that you were dead in your trespasses and sins. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. In other words, we were totally separated from God. Completely, 100%. And there's absolutely no way in the world, ladies and gentlemen, that you and I can bridge that gap. <clears throat> no way in the world that we can deal with our own trespasses, deal with our own sins. We are helpless. Every single person in this room, you are helpless without the blood of Jesus. And that sin, as God created this plan, He knew that that sin would separate us from God. Again, a very familiar passage is Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death. It's death. We all understand this morning, I pray everyone here probably old enough to understand, yes, there will be a physical death in our life, but understand there is also a spiritual death that can take place if we do not know Jesus as our Lord and Savior. The wages of sin is death. The wages of unconfessed sin is death. The wages of sin without Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior is death. It is an eternal separation from God. But he says, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. But the gift of God. There are a lot of reasons for God's plan of salvation. But let me ask you something this morning. What was your reason for being saved? Think about that for just a moment this morning. You see, as a pastor, I've heard a lot of his reasons why folks want to be saved. I've had a lot of reasons and heard a lot of reasons of why folks come down the aisle, not for the first time, but maybe it's the second time. Sometimes it could even be the third time. And they say, well, Brother Tim, I came the first time. I was really, really young. <coughs> Excuse me. I was really, really young, and, and I just didn't know what I was doing. That can happen. Brother Tim, I came down the aisle when I was really... My best friend came. And so I walked down the aisle too. I just thought that was what we needed to do. That's not real. That doesn't count, folks. What are the reasons for your salvation experience? Do they fall into God's reasons? Do they fall into God's plan? Do you realize and have you realized that you are a sinner, that you are helpless by yourself, and that that sin separates you from God? Listen, I love, love, love when young children come forward. Man, I think it's awesome when young kids come forward, they know Christ. It's a real thing that happens in their life. 
Why not have a lifetime of serving the Lord instead of waiting around till you get older and you've all this mess up and sit in front of it? Man, just come to know Christ as soon as you can. That's a good thing. But it, it, it I struggle. I struggle with young kids, young children who sometimes come down and say, I, I want to be baptized. I've heard that, honestly, too many times. You see, God's plan of salvation, it's not about baptism. It's about being forgiven of our sins. And again, reliving your salvation experience. I want you to make sure this morning that when you walk down that aisle, when you gave your life to Christ, when you prayed that sinner's prayer, did you do that because God was leading you to do that or for some other reason? Reasons for God's plan of salvation are there. But not only did God give us some reasons that we need this, but He also gave us resources for God's plan of salvation. And folks, the biggest resource of God's plan is that He loves us. He loves us. These resources are there. They are all around us. <coughs> Excuse me. I think the story that kind of relates this better than anything else, these resources that are there and God's love for us that is there is the story of the parable of the lost son. There's a dad who loves his children and one who decided on their own that I'm going to go off and I'm going to do my own thing and that's exactly <clears throat> exactly what happens that younger son goes off and uh, does his own thing and lives his own life and just runs as far away from the father as he can but there comes a point in time when that young son decides and realizes that I left the best thing I ever had. I'm missing, I'm missing out on what is more important than anything else out here in the world. <clears throat> and he goes home. And the Bible tells us that from a long way off, the Father's been watching. The Father's been waiting. The Father is looking for his son to come home. Folks, that happens because God loves us. The resources of God's plan of salvation, God's active love toward us. He says in Romans 5, verse 6, For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. <clears throat> Can you imagine what it would be like today? if Jesus came into the world for the first time in today's society. Man, I cannot imagine what that would be like. The way our world is today, I cannot imagine what that would be like. But yes, some 2,000 years ago, God's timing was perfect. And in the midst of that, God sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to die for us. Verse 8 of that same Romans chapter 5 says, But God proves His own love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Folks, the resources of God's plan of salvation, God's love for us, God's de desire to do everything for us, that even as sinners, Jesus would die for us. The death of a cross. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, it says, For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but it is the power of God to those who are being saved. Man, it is the power of God, this cross, salvation. It is all the difference in the world. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, Paul says it this way. He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us 
so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That in him we might have the resources of God's plan of salvation. We might have everything that we need to be saved. So what do we have to do? What is required of us to be saved? I want you to understand this morning <clears throat> that there's a lot of different ways to, to say, I guess, the, the idea, the requirements that I'm about to share with you. There's a lot of different ways to say those things, but it all kind of boils down to this. And, and I'm going to go ahead and step out and just say it this way. Folks, these are not things that you have a choice in. There are some things in life, if you're going to do, you've got to do it right. <clears throat> and if you're going to be saved, You've got to do it right. Okay? It's not about joining the church. And it's not about being a good person. But God has a requirement for his plan of salvation. That plan begins with the word repentance. You and I must be willing to repent. Luke 13, 3 says, No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish as well. Now, Jesus said that. That's Luke. That's Christ. Those are his words. Unless you repent, you will perish. There's a lot of reasons I've heard folks walk down an aisle. But folks, you can walk down this aisle, but if you're not sorry for your sins, it doesn't count. If you've not had a moment in time in your relationship with Christ and, and, that, and that moment where it started where you said, Christ, I, I'm sorry. I will repent of my sins. I'm a sinner. I need to repent of my sin. Not only repentance, there has to be faith. Acts chapter 16 verse 31 says, and they said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Faith. Faith is something that sets us apart. It is something that, that just sets us apart from the rest of the world, from the rest of, the, uh, of those, quote, religious ideas that are out there. Folks, we don't have faith in an individual and in a person. We don't have faith in a denomination. We don't have faith in a pastor. We must have faith in Jesus. He is the Son of God. He came and died for our sins. We must repent. We must have faith. We must confess. Folks, you can want to repent. But if that's all you do, you didn't finish the job. You can say that I've repented and I've got some faith. But if that's all you do, you haven't finished the job. You must confess. Romans chapter 10, very familiar verses, but they are true if you confess with your mouth, it's verses 9 and 10. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Folks, we cannot just repent. And we cannot just say that we believe, that we have faith. We must confess. Verse 13 of that same Romans chapter 10. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Confession, repentance, faith, confession leads to salvation and nothing else. You can't just do one. You can't do two. You've got to have all three. And folks, you can't confess without faith and repentance. They all have to go together. These are God's requirements for salvation. 
And when you think about your salvation experience, your salvation moment in time, were all of these a part of that moment? Were you there actually repenting of your sins? Do you truly have that faith? Do you truly confess Jesus is Lord? It has to happen for God's plan of salvation to take place. And you say this morning, well, Brother Tim, how do we know? How do we know that we know that this stuff is real? How do we know that we know that we are where we are supposed to be? Well, the Bible is pretty clear that after we go through all of these reasons and resources and requirements for salvation, that there is also results of God's plan of salvation. Let me just touch on a few of these this morning. See where you stand. See where we stand. You see, the Bible tells us that after God's plan of salvation has really, truly, 100% taken hold in our life, that we will become a new person. We will not be the way we were before. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. The new has come. Listen, folks. <clears throat> I understand that none of us are perfect, even as a child of God. But listen to me real good this morning. You not being perfect is not a license for you to live a sinful life. You knowing that you're going to make mistakes does not give you the ability to, well, I'm going to just do it anyway. God's going to forgive me anyway. It's going to be all right. Listen, I have run across individuals who believe themselves to be a child of God and had that kind of attitude. And the only thing I'm going to say about that kind of attitude is this. If you truly are a child of God, you will not have that sinful nature in your life. That's the old creature. You have become a new creature in Christ. And if that new creature is not there, then you don't know Jesus. The most important thing this morning, before anybody walks out of that door, is for you to know that you know that you know Jesus. The Bible says we become a new creature in Christ. Not only that, we understand and realize that our sins are forgiven. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace. Man, we are forgiven. Of all the things in my life, as a child of God that I long for because I mess up just like you. Of all the things that I hold dear to my heart is the fact that I know that as a child of God my sins are forgiven. They're forgiven. Not because of anything that I can truly do other than say, Lord, forgive me, but they're forgiven because of the blood of Jesus. Because He is my Lord. He is my Savior. He is my God. And those forgiveness of sin leads us to a peace with God. Romans chapter 5 verse 1 says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Justified by faith, we have peace with Jesus. In other words, there's a qualifying aspect there. In other words, salvation has got to be real. And folks, if you're struggling with peace in your life, spiritual peace in your life right now, in the months past, weeks past, 
weeks to come, it just may be because you don't truly know Jesus. A child of God. A true born again believer will experience the peace of God. The Bible says we've also been adopted into a family. A new family. John chapter 1 verse 12, But to all who did receive him, he gave them the right to be children of God. Now everybody in this room, <clears throat> our families are different. There's folks in this room today who had a great family life. And there's folks in this room today who really don't want to talk about their family. That's the world we live in. It's difficult. It's hard. We try to pray and lift each other up, but those things happen. But folks, when we become a child of God, we are then adopted into God's family. And folks, that is a family that I can tell you this, will always love you. There's never going to be a time in your life as a child of God, there'll never be a time in your life when God doesn't love you. He may be disappointed in us, but He'll always love us. There'll never be a time in your life when God is not there. Other things in this world, they're, they're there for a fleeting moment, but they come and go, and that's, that's sadly how the world is. But God will always be there. You're part of His family now. Even when the rest of the world and everybody else seems like they're headed in another direction, God is there with you. Man, what a wonderful blessing it is to know that as we are adopted into a family, it is a family that, however you want to describe your best ideal family, of all the things that your family could do for you, it never comes close to what God desires to do for you as a part of His family. To be adopted into a new family, to also experience eternal life, but to experience that eternal life now. You know, a lot of times when we think about eternal life, we think about what happens after we die. <clears throat> Folks, we don't die. Christians don't die. Okay? We may leave this world, but we don't die. Man, we are with God. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. There is no death for a child of God. There's just glory. Man, there's just awesome experience. John chapter 5, verse 24, Truly I tell you, Anyone who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life will not come under judgment, but has passed from death, that eternal separation from God, we pass from death to life, eternity with God. Man, can you imagine? For the believer, everlasting life is now. And it's only, only going to get better. Man, the closer we get to glory, the better life is going to be. There's going to be tough times here on earth. But all the glory that is to come, the experience, all of these things, God's plan of salvation. I believe wholeheartedly that when Jesus Christ died on the cross, He died for the sins of the world. He died for the sins of every single individual in this room. Every single individual that will ever be born. Jesus died for everybody. And so if you're here this morning, maybe 
Maybe you've experienced Christ as your Lord and your Savior. And man, if you have this morning, cherish that. Enjoy that. Embrace that. Remember that. Think about that. Man, let that drive you to be a better child of God. Let it drive you to share the gospel with others. Let it drive you to be everything God would have you to be. And yet maybe this morning, you're here. Maybe you have walked down an aisle before. Maybe you even got wet in, in some water before. But all the things weren't the way they were supposed to be. Maybe you walked down because somebody else walked down an aisle. Well, you need to get it right. Maybe you, you felt something going on and listen, things go on in the heart but sometimes it's just indigestion. You can't get saved over indigestion. You get saved by the power of Jesus. So I've asked this question before. Pastors have asked and said, made this statement for years. Do you know that you know that you know that today you are a child of God? God's plan of salvation for every single person in this room. What have you done? Where do you stand? Are you a part of a new family? Or is today the day you need to join the family of God? The altar will be open, as always. Maybe you just need to pray about it for a little while. I'll just say this when I, I, I said that, but I want to say this. The old devil may tell you you need to just pray about it for a little while. Don't pray about something for so long that you keep putting it off and nothing ever happens. When you hear God speaking to your heart, listen to your heart, not always your head. This time, these moments, you do business with the Lord. You do what God has called you to do. You know that your plan, God's plan of salvation for you, has been worked out fully and completely just the way it's supposed to. And if not, don't leave here today without it being right. If you know, you know that it's not right. Fix it today. Let's pray. Father, thanking you for this moment, thanking you for our time together, thanking you, Father, for your word, your plan of salvation for each and every one of us. <coughs> Father, I pray this morning, if there's anyone here today, they know right now that they need Jesus. They know right now, Lord, that what they need more than anything else is to be right with you and, and they, they're ready to repent. Maybe they're repenting even right now. They have a faith, but for, Father, they, they need to confess it and tell the world that Jesus is their Lord. Father, whatever the case, whatever needs to happen, the altar may be filled. Whatever happens, Lord, may your will be done, I pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Stand with me. Sing, pray, come forward. Whatever God may place on you.